Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting the channel via PayPal or Patreon. You'll find the links in the video description. I'm going to show you a famous game from the 19th century, famous principally for its final position, which really is remarkable. So stick around to the end of the game. And it also features, yes, the Sicilian with 4E5, the Kalashnikov, and coincidentally, uh, my chessable course on Sicilian Kalashnikov is on sale at the moment, on sale till the 1st of May, so do check it out. I'm really proud of the course. Now, here, knight b5 is the main move, and that is the Kalashnikov variation, but white has several alternatives here. And I remember when I was playing this move as a teenager, in fact, invariably, my opponents would play one of these other moves, which actually don't challenge black that much. And indeed, in this game, white exchanged on c6 and then played bishop c4. So what is this game? I should mention it. So this was from one of the matches between Alexander Macdonald, an Irishman, against Louis de Labordonne, Frenchman, and they were huge rivals in the early part of the 19th century. This is match. This game is from 1834. And in these these series of matches they had, Labordone came out on top, and he was really known unofficially as as the best player in Europe. Um, but it's interesting that to see him play 4e5. Um, and in fact, he played it in several games, and. MacDonald's reaction is, well, I think sort of very 19th century romantic, really. Not thinking too much about the positional considerations, but actually just wanting to get his bishop to c4 and looking at the, the weakest point on the board, f7. But as we're going to see, I think Labordoni's strategic understanding was just on a different level. I think he appreciated that already... Black is very comfortable here because black now has a majority of pawns in the centre. And mark my words, that is going to be significant in this game. So knight f6. And, well, as I show in the course, you know, if white plays a sensible move like knight c3, a standard move, that already after bishop b4, black is more than fine. I mean, white is struggling to equalise this position because black is already threatening to take here, threatening to play d5. I mean, it's a beautiful position. Macdonald played bishop g5, and, well, he was clearly worried about d5 as well. The problem is that, actually, white gives away the two bishops. He's still trying to prevent d5, but no, d5 comes anyway. I mean, black doesn't need to strike out so quickly, but why not? If pawn takes pawn... Black is more than fine here. So, for example, after this, black holds the pawn center, can castle, and, well, already has the better chances. Now, MacDonald exchange on f6. Put the bishop back, both sides castled. Well, just have a look at this. Um, that's a pretty good outcome for black from the opening. Strong pawn center, two bishops... It's a fantastic position for black, but still, you've got to make something of it. And this next move is excellent. Pawn to a5. So threatening a4, threatening bishop a6. Very good. White exchanged. I mean, it's already a tough position. Rook d1. Hoping to get some pressure, but d4. Black is still in control, and that bishop, you know, can support the center like this. It's a tough position for white. I mean... I guess it's best just to bring a knight out, but c4, this looks pretty ugly. I think it, it's so interesting looking at these games. Remember, Macdonald, one of the best players, supposedly in Europe at that time, but c4 is so anti-positional. He's obviously trying to get some counterplay with this pawn, but it just means that this pawn center can't be challenged. You know, at least you would hold out a hope later on of maybe playing c3, but after this... Well, black is just doing really well. Queen b6, so try and perhaps 
looking to pressure this pawn. But actually, it's not possible. I mean, obviously not possible to take it now because of the check. Bishop e7, that's more like it. That's a good move. Knight d2, and even taking now is, is rather problematic after queen d3 actually threatening this and threatening to, to attack the queen. So rookie eight. This move I really like. So, you know, why why put this rook here? Why not rook fe8? I mean, you could put the rooks in the middle, but this one, Labordone appreciates that he wants to get all his pawns in the center. Well, these pawns can be supported by the f pawn. So that's why he is leaving his rook on f8. So this is good judgment. And it means after knight e4, the bishop just drops to d8. And now he's ready to roll. So this is MacDonald's idea. So he's looking to get some counterplay with this c-pawn, but it's not great. The queen and bishop line up. So already f5 is a threat to push the knight and deliver mate on g2. So that's why f3 is played. But that, of course, is a weakness uh, that weakens white's king opens things up bishop e7 covers the d6 square and now well f5 was played and it works out splendidly actually this is not accurate bishop a6 would have avoided a lot of trouble and black just maintains this enormous advantage but after f5, in fact, after the check, it's not so clear. Bishop a4 was played, but knight d6 is the move. I mean, this starts to get very tricky. But after this, well, this is a sort of little four sequence. Um, better move this rook. So rook e7, rook a5. It, this is still isn't clear. I mean, I would I would take black every time here. These pawns still look like a threat, but the king can perhaps move over to blockade. Uh, it's it's not still not completely clear. In any case, bishop a4 played. Queen h6, and now it all starts to happen. Um. Here's a fun variation, actually. So white took on e8. Let me just show you this, because this is good fun. Knight d6 takes. Bishop takes rook. And now if black is just very cool and keeps the two bishops, in fact, black's attack on the king side is irresistible. What I love about this is that these pawns just hold back White's pieces in the center. Um, and black now exploits you know, these weakened dark squares here. So bishop d7, and now e4 opens this up. And after g3, I should say, just a reminder, this is not the game. Just wanted to show you this because it's it's just a very nice variation. Bishop takes. Now, black is the whole rook down, but this is completely winning. If the king steps up, to the h file then the rook just swings over so king f1 now black just takes these pawns and again rook f6 and it'll either come to g6 or h6 and that's decisive so just see how those pawns dominate the position these rooks simply can't get a look in here at all because of the pawns so they give black the cover to maneuver into the attack, basically. So I'm misfiring with the arrows terribly. Okay, let's go back. That was not the game, folks, but let's see. Okay, let's dash to the end of the game. Bishop takes, pawn takes. And now he crashes through. Um, if pawn takes, then queen e3 check and black is in. So rook c2. Um, even here, Labordoni makes an inaccuracy, as my computer tells me. My computer tells me that bishop a6 is best, but after this, in fact, white is still in the game after rook f2. But this happened. 
f2, here we go. So the threat is pawn to d3 and then f1. d3 anyway. A bishop exchange and e4. Okay, here we go. It's space invaders time. Okay, that can be stopped very easily. And now the back rank is a problem for white. Rook c1, d2. Aha, uh -huh. you might well have seen this one before. I mean, there is absolutely no defense for white. Okay, a cheap trick. That's no problem. We can do that. Rook d1, and now beautiful move, e3. And can you spot the finish? I think there's more than one finish here. Queen takes and e2. And that was the final position of the game. What a beautiful picture with uh, one of these pawns about to land. Absolutely fantastic. And then, then it's mate on the back rank. Now, that is a triumph for the center pawns. And I want to take you back to the fifth move. Knight takes c6, strategic mistake. Because after this, black is set up to roll in the center. And the logical consequence of all that was that final position. There you go. <laughs> it all ties in. Don't forget. Well, actually, got a, a quote from Kasparov from from uh, my my great predecessors. This fantastic tome. Part my great predecessors, part one. He wrote, Labordone did indeed play more deeply than his opponent, seeing strategic trumps which the latter was unaware of, and it was this that decided the matches. Yeah, McDonnell, very good tactician. Uh, but strategically, Labordone, as shown here, was on a different level. Remember, my chessable course on the Sicilian Kalashnikov is on sale till on sale till the first of May. You don't just get a repertoire, but I I talk about strategy, the kind of things you should be looking out for, the manoeuvres. Talk about the pawn structure. Um, so, you know, there are lots of model games where I, where I talk things through very clearly. So I would highly recommend it. Thanks for watching.